were you on September 1st, 2011? I was taking a class on how to prepare taxes, and my husband, Frank, was supposed to fly away on a business trip, but his plane never left the ground. Amy, Amy Gant, was already in Europe on a business trip, and her husband, Al, began to worry. Would Amy ever come home? Who was responsible for this violence? Would it break out worldwide? When would Amy come home? Would there be further violence that could sweep her away, preventing her from ever coming home? His heart ached with love and concern for his wife. He lived in restless anticipation and prayerful anxiety until she finally came home into his arms. 2,998 people are not home with their families as a result of that day's violence. That includes the 19 hijackers, the 246 people flying on the four planes, the 2,606 people in the towers, the 125 people in the Pentagon, the 411 emergency workers, the policemen, the firemen, and the medical aid people, and two additional people who were later added to the list of victims because they died from an illness caused by inhaling that toxic dust. <coughs> Although this event took place in America, 70 countries lost citizens that day. I think that God cried at the brokenness of our world, and as each of God's beloved was welcomed into God's eternal home. These men and women will be remembered not just for the way that they died, but for the way that they lived their lives and by the people that loved them. A few weeks after that tragedy, more than 4,000 religious leaders gathered from all faiths, and they signed a statement that was printed in an ad in the New York Times. They spoke of the moral response to terrorism. We must not allow this terror to drive us away from being the people that God has called us to be, the statement said. We assert the vision of community, tolerance, compassion, justice, and the sacredness of human life, which lies at the heart of all of our religious traditions. America must be a safe place for all our citizens in all of their diversity, and it is especially important that citizens who share the national origins, ethnicity, or religion with whoever attacked us are themselves protected among us. Human beings can be such sinful and violent creatures. In the weeks and months that followed 9-11, there were numerous hate crimes against people who were perceived to be Muslim, or Middle Eastern, or Arab. Many Sikhs were threatened, and one was murdered just for wearing a turban. Mosques were vandalized, but so were Hindu temples. Fear and lack of understanding caused people to act in irrational and harmful ways. At the same time, the American Muslims were swift to condemn the acts of 9-11, and their leaders called upon Muslim Americans to come forward with their skills and resources to help alleviate the sufferings of the affected people and their families. They gave money monetary donations for the rebuilding and for the support of relief work. They organized blood drives. They provided medical assistance and um, food and shelter for the victims. They were part of the 4,000 religious leaders that worked together on that statement of hope that was printed in the New York Times. When a frightening or tragic event like this occurs, we turn to our church to make sense of our world. 
people flooded into church, into temple, and into mosque that Sunday that followed, looking for security and love and for hope. They were looking for a place where they could feel the presence of God's arms work, welcome them home, and help them to understand the new state of the world. In the times since, the United Methodist Church has turned to reason and tradition and to their witness of Christ in the word, world and to scripture to teach people how to cooperate with others of different beliefs. In today's reading from Matthew, we are reminded that all humans are imperfect and sinful creatures and they need forgiveness repeatedly. Not just seven times, but 77 times, a number that represents ongoing forgiveness. We mess up over and over again. Each week when we come here and we gather, we pray the words that the Lord taught us with our urgent plea to be forgiven as we forgive those who have sinned against us. That freedom of forgiveness frees us from the burden of carrying grudges, and it frees us for movement forward in hope, in possibility, in the grace of God. The readings from Roman, Romans that Jean just read so well teach us about judgment. There is useful judgment and harmful judgment. Judgments that stop us from engaging in behaviors that are deathly to our lives and to our relationships, that's a good kind of judgment to use. It's useful. But judgment that condemns people, pushes them into boxes of good and bad, judgment that devalues people, lessens their worth, that kind of judgment is harmful. When we judge that way, we are limiting God because we are limiting our ability to love. Instead, Paul suggests that we welcome each other and put up with each other's feelings. Paul, the author of Romans, gives us three reasons why we should bear with each other's differences. First, each of us is practicing holy, things that we consider holy, to honor God. I really enjoyed the biblical interpretation of these verses in the message. Because it said, if you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God, and then thank God for prime rib. But if you're a vegetarian, eat vegetables to the glory of God, and thank God for broccoli. I know which we'd be thanking in our house. Secondly, if it is God, we are answerable, not to each other. The scripture says that's why Jesus lived and died and lived again so that he could be our master across the entire range of life and death and free us from the tyrannies that we impose on each other. And third and last, God is the final judge and this ultimate judge is enough. We're all going to end up kneeling before God. Every knee will bow, it says in verse 11, and every tongue will confess that I am God and the only God. God's advice to the church at Rome and to those of us who read their mail is to tend to our own knitting. We've got our hands full just taking care of our own life before God. So how has the United Methodist Church been tending to their own knitting? How has it been following that scriptural advice? Since 9-11, people of all faiths have opened their hearts and their homes to each other in the hopes of getting to know each other so that they won't just be stranger or enemy, they will be neighbor. Mrs. Betsy Wiggins, the wife of a Methodist minister, began by inviting a Muslim woman from a local mosque into her home for coffee. And then they decided to broaden the conversation and they invited 18 others from the Abrahamic faiths, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, to come together for a potluck. 
And from there, they worked together and they <coughs> formed a uh, interfaith council called Women Transcending Boundaries. And they now spend their time working on joint mission projects. And another story. When the Memphis Islamic Center was under construction, the Heart Song Church, which is also United Methodist, posted a sign outside welcoming them to the neighborhood. This one act of, con of kindness began a relationship between the two congregations that end up strengthening them both. They have shared meals together, they have worked in homeless shelters together, and they are currently building a new park for the community together. But they've also faced challenges together. Reverend Stone was called a heretic for allowing the Muslims to gather for prayer in the Methodist church building when the Islamic center was not completed in time for their holy month of Ramadan. But his congregation backed him up saying, the building is not the church. The church is the people sitting in the room. When they are gathered there for worship, it is holy ground. When the church is over, it becomes just another multi-purpose room. The pastor says, Jesus told us to love our neighbors, and they were actually our neighbors, and they needed us. Heart Song is not the only church that has developed relationships with the Islamic centers. There are at least five United Methodist congregations coordinating with Muslim neighbors to sponsor blood drives this weekend. They've also faced critics that accuse them of blurring the lines between Christianity and Islam. Each group involved agrees that they have learned to respect each other, but they remain very clear on what their beliefs are. They are very clear that they are Muslims. We are very clear that we are Christians, says one pastor. Well, Delmont does not have a close relationship with an Islamic community. You have opened up your church to others. And many people call this place home. Ray Ringgold told me of stories of his family being part of the construction team that brought this building here in 1924. And Jean Fox has been an active member for over 40 years. She remembers a time when her children and the Fossler children were the core members of an active youth group. Louise Lyon prefers the closeness of our small church over the anonymity of a big church. Melvin Chase has bulletins and ditto sheets. I mean, ditto sheets. He saves the ditto sheets from decades past. Several of you, like Elaine Ball and Anna Hicks, joined the church during times of great pain in your life. This is God's house but it has become our home. A place where we can find acceptance and friendship, forgiveness and healing, meaningful worship and God's presence. Delmont United Methodist Church is a place where the Holy Spirit strengthens us for God's vision of community that includes tolerance and compassion and acceptance and justice and the sacredness of life. Delmont United Methodist Church is a place where we're aware of God's grace molding us and molding our lives and where we learn that one day we will be wrapped in God's eternal arms and welcomed into God's home in glory. This is a great church and I found you to be a loving con congregation. And I urge you to continue to grow by carrying Christ's love out into your work, into your school, and into your play. I pray that you invite friends and neighbors to discover the support that our congregation has to offer and to come and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And in this way, we can honor the memories of the men and women of 9-11 
by being the people that God called us to be. Amen.